Hey, wrestling fans, this is Mr. Technical Barry Horowitz. You're watching WZWA. It's awesome. <laughs>Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the WZWA Network podcast here on YouTube and all platforms of podcasting. I am your host with the most on the West Coast, California in Fury. It is so good to be with you here today and things are a little bit different. It's daytime. Usually I'm doing these interviews at about 11 p.m. at night, but this time I flipped the script. I'm up in the morning. It's nice to be up in the morning for once and... To be joined with a guest right now that uh, has been a bucket list guest for me personally. Very excited to talk to this man. He's a journeyman in the history of professional wrestling. He is Mr. Technical Barry Horowitz. Barry, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, Carl. Uh, I'm glad you're having me on the show. I appreciate it. Big, I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, podcasts and especially yourself coming from Australia. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, it's uh, podcasting is is a big deal right now, especially in wrestling. Yeah. I think almost every wrestler uh, out there has their own show. Um, but uh, as per usual, Barry, when I start the show, I like to ask uh, each guy who's been in the business how they first became a wrestling fan when they were a young man. Oh, basically, uh, my parents and I were moving into a uh, newer house, and you know when you you're setting up a house and you're waiting on the moving people to come in and there's nothing around really. You're sitting on, you know, like uh, lawn chairs and you got a TV on a, on a box because we're waiting on the moving men to get all our stuff in. So basically uh, we were sitting there in the living room and we had a TV set like on a, uh, like a box, like, you know, to, um, uh, similar to a TV stand, but it was a box. Like I said, everything was in storage and we were waiting on stuff. And wrestling came on, Championship Wrestling from Florida with Gordon Soley. And the participants were uh, Mr. Clean and Thunderbolt Patterson. Now I'm about, I don't know how old I was, 13 or 14. I saw that and I decided that's what I'm going to be. Now, a lot of kids at that age say that and they don't do that and then they become a magician a rock star country music singer uh who knows crocodile dundee you know they they don't they don't uh they don't go the journey but you know i'm a different type of breed and i believe in paying dues and doing it the right way so i basically started getting in shape and worked out at a youth center that was uh free it was near my uh, home in St. Petersburg, Florida, and lifted weights, went on the wrestling team, went on through high school and college, and decided, you know, um, you know, this is the way, in my eyes, you build a good foundation. I mean, it's good coming from other sports. I I've seen basketball into football and whatnot, but um, I'm just a big believer in just, you just don't come off the street and you get smartened up to pro wrestling, you become a good talent. I mean, sometimes it happens. But I really think, uh, you know, like Garth Brooks says in the song, The Dance, you got to go, you know, you got to climb those steps to get to the dance. You know, another song is Miley Cyrus's Climb. It's almost the same re representation. You got to do that climb. You can't just, uh, you know, they just can't. Um, you're in the business for a cup of coffee or a minute, three weeks, and you got the Southern title. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, which, by the way, is the true. Which, by the way, is a true story in Florida. But that's <laughs> another story, and it's just not a good way of paying dues. Um, I believe in the way I was broken in by Professor Boris Malenko and his sons, and also Carl Gotch, Carl von Stroheim, doing it for a year and a half in a mattress factory warehouse in Florida. It's 104 degrees in the summer. It's 40 in the winter, <laughs> three times a week part-time job. I mean, you're, and you're working out in the ring with Malenko for at least two or three hours. I mean, you pay your dues. It, it really builds character. It's an institution. It builds accountability. 
I mean, you know, you got all that foundation and then you have other things, you know, uh, it's not all getting in the squared circles, conducting yourself as a true pro outside the ring, inside the ring, using your platform properly, not taking advantage, not being a, a goofball, getting arrested on WrestleMania night or something, you know, you know, it just, um, there's a lot that stems into a good wrestler or worker, whatever, which one you want to call it, or a great worker. Excellent. Big difference. Bro. Yeah. Big difference. I kind of fast forwarded through everything uh, really quick. I mean, that, that is my foundation. That wasn't my house. Malenko built my foundation to go on to the rest of the house. That's traveling, getting polished, traveling with the likes of Steamboat, Youngblood, Bob Orton Jr., Ric Flair, Rufus R. Jones, Bugsy McGraw, uh, Handsome Jimmy Valiant, uh, Bob Backlin. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. And all you got to do, you're green, you're a rookie, sit in the back seat, keep your mouth shut, listen and absorb. Try your best, stay out of trouble, don't be made an example of, watch a lot of old stuff. I used to watch Georgia Championship Wrestling, World Class, over and over and over to perfect different moves, go over things. Again, good worker, great worker. Excellent, bro. Yeah, all that hard work does pay off. And I would say that it probably didn't take you long to uh, get a good reputation in the business. And I'm sure a lot of people enjoyed working with you uh, because of that. I think so to a certain extent, uh, Carl. You know, you got your jealous guys and they worry about their win-loss record <laughs> and uh, their egos and so forth. They, they forget where they are in life and what you're doing. It it's not like it's not like you're just giving in or just saying, oh, I don't care. It has nothing to do with that. It's called business. And I think I'm totally business. Um, sometimes the business takes advantage of that, but nobody's twisting my arm to stay in that business. Uh, there's a lot of true pros and I, I professionalism uh, is really big with me. I know I am. I know Kurt Angle is the ultimate pro. I mean, the gentleman is, is a world-class Olympic U.S. Olympic team wrestler. I mean, come on. You can't, you know, you could be NCAA, AAU, Big Army, Big Navy. You're not a gold medalist and win it with a broken neck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Th this guy's a whole different breed of amateur wrestling. I mean, He's at his pinnacle. His, his promos are awesome. His look is good. He adapted to the business quickly. I got to give the man props. I've only met him once. Uh, highly admire him. Uh, respect him. Never traveled with him. I know he had some issues back in the day, maybe some demons, but he rectified him. Good for him. You know, you, you have a choice in life. You know, you could do a 360. You can go to jail. You could straighten up, which is the number one. And then the ultimate, you could die, self-inflicted or just being stupid. Um, you know, um, it's a shame, but uh, I, I try to sell, I try to uh, keep myself at a pride level, and it's not what I care about. Other people think they're not paying my bills or taking care of my family. I'm yeah. going to do what I think is right. I think uh, a lot of people, some promoters, not all. And some, uh, some of my so-called um, acquaintances in the business uh, would mistake kindness for weakness. I, I use the word acquaintance, and I don't care if they don't like this. I mean, if you want a friend in the wrestling business, buy a dog. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I've heard a lot yeah, of people. That's not, um, that's, not, that's, not Barry, that's not Barry Horowitz being pissed or bitching or disgruntled. No. There's a difference. See, if I wasn't in shape, and I mean, I think I look pretty good even at my age right now, uh, as far as training, went to school for training, went to school for uh, sports nutrition as a nutritionist. I went to a really good school, FSU. Um, if I didn't do that and didn't participate in the ring properly, and if I was late always and you're not training and all that, then you could say it's bitching. But when you got almost, and I say almost, the total package, you know, with your your promos and whatnot, it just, 
sometimes it's just a, you know, guys like me, I, Jim Coronet said it on his podcast. Maybe I was too nice or too good. <laughs> I don't know. You know, uh, I'm not trying to put myself over, but maybe Jim Coronet's got a point. <laughs> I can see what you mean, bro. Um, so uh, one thing I really wanted to ask you about is, uh, you know, uh, I guess the, uh, some people call it an enhancement talent. Um, mm -hmm. We've had Dwayne yeah. on the show and Dwayne talked about, you know, oh. the way that he saw uh, being an enhancement talent and the pride he took in his job with that. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're just as important part of the puzzle as the top guy, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, could you tell yeah. me a little bit about how you feel about that term and, 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 and how you feel, you know, you're probably one of the most famous ones uh, of mm -hmm. all time. Uh, and uh, how do you feel about, you know, enhancement talents? Well, first of all, thank you for that compliment. And, and, and first and foremost, uh, Dwayne Gill, Barry Hardy. Uh, there's, I know there's a slew of others from Baltimore and the Northeast. Stand up guys, good workers, great workers. Um, yeah, it, let's put it this way, Carl. There's got to be a winner. There's got to be a loser. I mean, the Patriots don't always win. My Buccaneers don't always win. Uh, UFC fighters don't always win. Uh, not everybody could be a superstar. You you know it's 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 just that's just the way it goes. I mean, once again, I'm going to rewind a little bit. If you're worried about your win loss record, all you got to do is go to UFC, step in the octagon with uh, with uh, <laughs> Brock Lesnar, and he'll beat your ass in about 20 seconds you'll wish you were back at madison square garden <laughs> exactly. yeah yeah that's, that's a shoot <laughs> but uh another great athlete um um brog lesnar national champion yeah big as a big as a house i'm big as a house too you know but one bedroom <laughs> thought i'd let you know that <laughs> yeah but uh anyway um yes we were so as far as the enhancement, it's, here's the deal. If you're a basic enhancement guy, hey, I got a full-time job with uh, Walmart or IBM or, or some big downtown monstrosity in Manhattan, New York, or Chase Manhattan, uh, the banking, uh, and you go there, you could tell the look on their face, their body language, their outfits, you go in there looking like a million dollars with no job face, which means the complaining face. It looks like <laughs> this. I mean, you're being announced on TV at Raw and, hey, from St. Petersburg, Florida, weighing 221 pounds, Barry Horowitz. And I, <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. People know what's going on. Um, the, the smart marks know what's going on. So anyway, if you're going to go out there with somebody like Ric Flair, Bret Hart, Owen Hart, and you're that part time of an enhancement, the match isn't going to go well. It's going to make Bret mad. It's he's not going to have a feather in his cap for that match. It's not going to put asses in the seats. But Barry Horowitz goes out there. Hey, we need nine minutes with Bret. I know what they want. I don't have an ego problem. Let's do this. Brett's not out there to hurt me. He's not out there to cheap shot me. If somebody is in this business, which is called a potato, I'm going to give him a receipt. I mean, I'm not a world-class tough guy, but I'm not going to let you run all over me either. I mean, I, I've been doing it since I've been doing this since I'm 21 years old, but um, so that's the difference. Now say you have an enhanced, yeah, here's a, the shoe on the other foot. So you have the basic enhancement guy going out there with somebody that's worse than him, you know, kind of like he runs to the ring, he shakes the top ropes, he puts face paint on, you know, and he can't work a lick. He don't know a wrist lock from a wristwatch. Yeah. And you're going to really lose him. You really need me to make it look like he knows his shit. Yeah, and absolutely. Really and we need to keep that match short because you'll put holes in it, which means you could see through that match. So it's important to have a guy that could go out there with Owen or Brett or Rick Martell, pull 10 minutes on TV, or, hey, we need Undertaker over strong. We need him over in a minute, okay? I can get that done too. 
And you could see the difference in quality with enhancement or a guy that's putting over somebody opposed to, excuse me, a guy that doesn't care. And if he doesn't care, he really shouldn't be there. He's just there for a payday. Stay in the Indies, do your backyard wrestling, do your bar shows and get your small amounts of money and, and go nowhere. If that's what you want. That's it. Um, I could, I guess, uh, you know, I found it interesting, obviously in your career, this is what you were doing for quite some time was uh, helping make others look better. But there did come a time in 1995 in the WWF where you got uh, a push working with one and only Chris Candido uh, and you got some surprise victories over him, even going to SummerSlam and performing on pay-per-view. What, a, what an amazing achievement for you there. Um, Please tell me a little bit about that and how it came to be that Barry Horowitz was now picking up some victories and and getting on pay-per-view with Chris. I think what basically, you know, every night I'd go into the ring, whether a house show, Monday Night Raw, no matter what, I'm putting on my best outfit. You got the oil on, you're getting pumped up, you're going over your match. I never took it lightly because you just don't know when it's your turn. Yeah, yeah. Or you could, or you could quit and they get somebody else. So obviously it paid off for me, my hard work, sweat, uh, training, uh, perfecting my craft. Somebody saw something and they said, let's give this a try. Obviously. Uh, I'm glad they picked Skip because basically he's almost a clone of me because he has a good attitude. He looked good. His promos, his gimmick. Um, you know, guys like me and Skip and Owen Hart, and me, we have no gimmick, but if you want to say a gimmick, here it is. We know how to wrestle. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so anyway, um, that that's what was that's what came about that. I mean, I went on for that whole year. I was I was at the WrestleMania in Anaheim. I was captain of my team at Survivor Series. Uh I was uh, I was going over in TV matches and in your house matches and Royal Rumbles and the list goes on with all their major pay-per-views. And uh, it was really cool um, to be a part of that. I was at the Slammies. I was nominated for Shocker of the Year. Uh, I mean, it was really, really, I'm grateful for all that. I, I wish I could have continued on a little bit longer that's their choice. I'm still grateful for what I got. Um, again, these guys that complain about the business or they were on the road too long. I mean, I, I, I don't get it. If it's your craft and you want to do that, I understand just ask for some time off maybe. And you're making a lot of money, (laughs) you know, buy some, buy some insurance, uh, take care of your family instead of going to the bars at four in the morning and dropping a thousand dollars and, you know, <laughs> thinking you're uh, king shit on Turd Island. <laughs> um, so I wanted to know no. what, what led to you uh, leaving the WWF, what the reason was that you uh, left the company. Well, basically, they just, uh, they really, nothing was wrong. Uh, oh, they, they had the famous excuse, and it's, it's good. It's in all jobs descriptions. We just don't have a place for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. But you... But you have a place for people that can't work. (laughs) 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 Brawler. Excuse me. (laughs) Sorry. That's okay. You got a bit of a cold there, mate. Um. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I always find that to be interesting when they say, oh, we don't have anything for you right now. Uh, the, the the people's jobs in creative is to ensure everybody has uh, a direction or something to do. So I always find that quite, um, yeah. And it's quite prevalent with a lot of people. It's a, a good excuse, um, I, I guess on their end. Uh, so uh, when you left the WWF, you end up going to WCW. I, I believe this is the second time you had been with WCW uh, in the late nineties. Um, how did that yep. come about? Did you get in touch with someone there or did someone reach out to you? I got in touch with Terry Taylor and he helped me uh, progress my journey through Eric Bischoff. And uh, yeah, it was uh, 
it was a pretty cool little journey. It, it only lasted two years, but I'm still grateful. I was uh, doing nitros and thunders and um, pay-per-views and then Saturday Night Lives. And uh, yeah, it was really good. And then some of that got chopped down and excuse me, I was just doing uh, Saturday nights. So it was still good though. We're still traveling and um, uh, having fun. And um, yeah, it was still, uh, I just wish the journey could have lasted longer. I understand. Um, So yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, performing on WCW Saturday night. And I I assume you would have probably performed on WCW worldwide as well. Yeah. Um, and you know they would do these big tapings uh, for these for these types of shows. Were you a part of those uh, worldwide tapings where you would be there for five days and there'd be two hundred matches recorded for six months worth of material? Oh, I was on some of those, but it was only um, the ones I was on. I think two or three days, or I don't know. I uh, where that was done, I could go back and forth because I only lived forty five minutes from there. That was done in Orlando, oh, cool. Florida. Yeah. The other guys had to stay over in a hotel. <laughs> so what's that experience like? I mean, there must have been, I don't know how many guys backstage. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I would hope that there was a, a certainly a, a good amount of catering there. Oh, yeah. 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 Took care of us. Uh, first class, the catering, the waters, the coffees, the juices. And I'm sure it's even more so now. And I always carry water with me and protein bars and whatnot. So I always come prepared. <laughs> of course. Um, so another thing I wanted to ask, you know, at this point in your career, was was there any hope that you would get a bit of a push or were you just happy with your spot doing what you what you were doing or would it have been nice well, to uh, maybe do a couple of angles and stories? Yes. Uh, I was never content. I mean, if, if I have a job, that's great. If your progress is great. But I'm not the type, well, you're not doing nothing with me. I'm quitting. I mean, I don't believe in that. I just don't believe in that. Um, That's my thought process. Uh, They were starting to do an angle with me and Alan Funk. Yeah. And we were in two weeks into the program. And then the whole thing got kiboshed because Vince bought WCW. Right. (laughs) Which, by the way, I was not properly told. No? No. It's kind of like uh, working for a store and you don't call in sick to work or you don't call in and say, I'm not coming in. You just don't show. Very unprofessional. Yeah, that's that is strange. Um, uh, You're speaking earlier about making people who can't work look good. Uh, And there was a a particular match that you had with uh, the one and only David Flair, who Ah. at at that time. (laughs) very young into the business, thrusted into this position. And I think he even became the United States champion as well during this time. But I remember there was a little bit of an angle with you uh, and Ric Flair trying to uh, <laughs> uh, get you to, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess, go into the match and throw the match. Uh, <laughs> right. Tell me they about that trying experience. To persuade me. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty cool. I, see, I was glad to be uh, picked for that. Uh, just, you know, highlights me more. And, uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, David Flair really, he had no career. Um, I don't think it progressed and I don't even think I, I saw him on TV. I don't think he's in good shape or anything. Now he's much older than when I seen him. The only one that's progressed is Charlotte and, uh, yeah. she's a hell of a worker, hell of a worker. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. She, uh, she doesn't work like your average woman wrestler. She's got the look, she's got the promos. She takes after her dad. I'm telling you, it's phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you did well with David Flair. You know, you couldn't tell that uh, yeah. <laughs> David. Uh, yeah, I remember. More. I remember uh, I did that angle with Flair and Sting came up to me and he, he told me he liked the way it went and how it, per, how it was. Um, he's always been, when I've been around Sting, not too many times, but very complimentary, very nice, not a ribber. Uh, I've worked with him a few times. He's, uh, he's sincere. Yeah. So I got to give him props. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, he did allude to your, uh, feud with Alan Funk. Uh, he was the third person we ever, uh, interviewed on the show and, uh, he was very complimentary of you when we spoke oh, with wow. him. Um, 
So uh, how did you feel working with some of these young guys coming out of the power plant like Alan Funk? Oh, I did. I liked it. Uh, so, most of them were really good, Carl. Some were disrespectful. Some got too much too soon. Uh, not too many. I, I Maybe two or three. But for the most part, it, it didn't go any further. It didn't get out of hand. But for the most part, uh, most of the power plant guys, uh, very good. Uh, you know, I respected them. They respected me. Uh, and it was genuine and sincere. It was right. very, it was very organic. That's good. Um, yeah. So you did allude to this earlier about how you found out that WCW has now been bought by the WWF. Uh, so how exactly did you find that out? Did you find it out through someone calling you on the phone or you did you what? find it out on the internet or... <laughs> I don't know how I found that out. I'm, I'm being honest, Carl. Um, mm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think it was the internet. I may have found it out through somebody in the know. Uh, you would think, you know, because almost every time if there's a discrepancy or something wrong or you're working on TV, Jimmy Hart would call you. That's funny. He didn't call me that day. Never got in touch with him and uh, never saw him again up until he's uh, some of these uh, meet and greets I do at WrestleCons and whatnot. But uh, maybe he lost my phone number. Maybe he forgot to call Barry. Maybe Barry's not important. Maybe he's on. <laughs> he's not on that A list. <laughs> I laugh. I laugh because it's uh, it's quite sad actually and uh, ignorant. But that's another story. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to know a little bit about what life was like after WCW. We still working the Indies for a while there. Um, yeah, I was working the Indies. I was going on uh, nutritional seminars, uh, up updating my uh, nutrition, uh, my counseling and whatnot. I was, you know, kind of had uh, had both oars in the water, so to speak. And then I finally got tired of the Indies. Um, just they started getting aggravating. So you, some of these weekend warrior promoters, I call them, they don't really have a clue. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'll try to help them. And, but sometimes it gets out of hand and um, uh, it's not that I'm spoiled, but I I've been their way. I I've been, I've been in their shoes, but I progressed to another pair of shoes. So I remember where I came from, but they don't, and then they don't respect you. And I really don't like that. I mean, yeah. some of these guys, I got more shower time than they got lifetime. <laughs> so, you know, I don't like, I don't like being disrespected, but on the other hand, it all depends what your name is. If you're up higher and you went over on TV, but you're a piece of crap, you look crappy. They'll, they'll still kiss your feet. Hey, uh, could I get you a first class ticket in? Uh, could I take you up at the Marriott? Uh, could I buy you a steak dinner? <laughs> oh, wow. Really? Is that, is that how you rate people? Sad. <laughs> Again, sad. But these, these are why they're called Mark Promoters. Absolutely. It's not a complimentary statement. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've, I've been witness to it to myself. I don't like to mm -hmm. go on about it too much on the show, but I did used to wrestle uh, about uh, 2014, um, between 2010, 2014. And there were a couple of promoters that I wrestled for that shouldn't have been uh, in that job whatsoever. Uh, right. so I, know, I know what it's all about. And um, yeah. So you did wrestle? I did wrestle, yes. Um, yeah. I noticed that. I noticed the shirt and the guns. <laughs> oh, I could do, I could be doing a bit better than I am these days, but uh, well, uh, nobody I, could I do, appreciate it. You're not going to be, you're not going to be Mr. Technical, Carl. So just <laughs> put that aside. Uh, I will completely forget about that. There's no chance. Um, okay. Very good. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there's, this is probably the one thing that I was most excited to ask you about. Uh, it's uh -huh. the 30th of June, 2013, the fourth annual Malenko Memorial Cup in Riverview, Florida. Uh, you wrestle a guy by the name of Kennedy Kendrick, and you also win a Malenko Cup Battle Royal in the main event. Was this your final match? Okay. This was in what year now? 2013. Okay. Um, unless I'll use a Brian Blair term, 
Uh, you know, when you forget stuff, Brian says, oh, too many chair shots. <laughs> you know, it's a joke. And especially it's a joke with me because I've only taken a few chair shots. Uh, I don't recall ever being in a Malenko Cup. I don't uh-huh. know that opponent. And or winning that battle royal. 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That was, no, that was not new. My last, excuse me, my last match was against Ricky Santana in Robarts Arena, uh, Sarasota, Florida. And that was 12 years ago. Oh, okay. I don't know where that info came from. Uh, I would have loved to have been there. I know where <laughs> Riverview is. It's not far from my house. Um, yeah, they never involved me in any of the Malenko Cups and stuff. I don't know what the deal is there. I've got yeah. no heat with anybody. They may have to pay me some money, so maybe that's the deal. <laughs> uh, you know, some of those guys are paying their dues, so they're wrestling for tickets or for minimum money. Uh, been there, done that. Uh, I've never wrestled for free ever. I was never taught that way by Malenko. Um, you know, Elvis doesn't sing for free. <laughs> I don't wrestle for free. Yeah, no, fair enough. So Ricky Santana was your last match. Did you know that that was your last match when you had it or? Um... No, not really. No, no, no. I, um, no, uh, no, not at all. Uh, no. It just, just uh, it just so happened to just be your last match. Yeah, yeah. Things yeah. changed and you just never I still stayed in, in contact with the business because right now I'm, I'm I'm seeking a coaching position in a major company. So I try to watch all um I try to keep up with all the federations to know my, you know, the main thing is it's good to know that and you could get caught up to speed in a matter of minutes. The big thing is is being a coach is being in shape, knowing what you're talking about, having over 20 years experience, being accountable. Not going to be drunk, not going to be late, not going to hurt somebody. Now, when I'm hiring somebody, that's what I'm looking for. Um, And it's good to know your product, but that's down the list a little bit. You want the accountability and the professionalism and the know-how to be first and foremost. Yeah. Um, So aside from uh, wanting to get a job with one of the major organizations as as a coach or a teacher of sorts uh, what else are you doing with yourself these days well mostly I, I i'm involved in my nutrition work counseling and also um um the the meet and greets and mo- mostly to meet when i do the meet and greets they're either at conventions or i do them for an indie show and i'm flown in they have matches but i get there early I critique the guys and I give them a a verbal seminar and then a hands-on seminar. So that's what I'm basically doing is seminars, hands-on teaching, wrestle cons, meet and greets. That's cool. Um, Had you been a little bit uh, away from um, the business for a while and then started doing these um, meet and greets and uh, was it good to catch up with some old friends again? Oh yeah, yeah. I I stayed away from from a couple of years just to be with family and had some uh, hardships and and some uh, some uh, uh, tragedies in the family. I don't want to go into, but laid low of the wrestling business. I needed to concentrate on my family and myself and my health, and did that. And then decided to okay, I'm I'm ready to go back and work for uh, more reliable people. Yeah, awesome. Um, Mm -hmm. So at this stage, I wanted to give you the opportunity to plug anything that you've got going on. um, And uh, before we hit our final segment, which is five seconds. Sure. Um, I'm real proud of my Facebook, uh, my Facebook, YouTube, WWE.com. Also the WWE Network. Uh, There'll be a backstory on me in the next uh, few months. It'll be airing for about two hours. It's behind the scenes uh, or behind the curtain. I forgot what it is. I was also involved in uh, an interview with Goldberg as far as his streak. I think it played already. Yes. Um, ProWrestlingTees.com. And um, my biggest one I'm very proud of is my Cameo.com. 
it's literally keeps me busy. I mean, before this interview, I did a couple of cameos. Uh, people, fans are genuine. I really respect them. And I think they respect me because the way I do what they want. What they want, I give them. Excellent. So, uh, so it's like I said, Facebook, it's YouTube. It's the WWE. You can go to BarryHorowitz.com. You could see all my matches on YouTube. There's a couple of YouTube shows involving me, the ProWrestlingTees.com and the cameo and uh that's basically that's basically what i um am doing as far awesome. as as far as the social media and my facebook has some different in, uh, interesting uh, my nephew takes care of that uh the only reason i don't i used to be involved in it heavily i got burnt out also i'm so busy he uh does that for a living he's an it guy and he does a really fantastic job his uh his name is Big Richie. <laughs> <laughs> well, good Funny. on you, Big Richie, for helping out your uncle. Yeah. Um so uh Barry, this final segment is called Five Second Frenzy. I told you about it before. Uh I just may ask you what your favorite blank is, and you let me know. Uh and even if you don't make the five second rule, it's okay, you won't get in any trouble. Okay, um, cool. Okay, so Barry Horowitz, Five Second Frenzy. Who is your favorite wrestler? Right now? Or just when you were a kid or? Oh, oh, that's a toss up between Don Morocco, Jack Briscoe and Mike Graham. Awesome. Uh, what was the favorite match that you ever performed in? Wow. Well, I would say SummerSlam would uh, skip all my Owen Hart matches and um, my defeating Jerry Lynn for the global light heavyweight title and also performing in Graz uh, for the CWF defeating Franz Schumann. Awesome. That's, uh, yeah, that's big highlights, big highlights. Uh, by the way, I have favorite promoters and Otto Wants is in my top five. So is Jerry Jerry. Cool. Yeah. Um, who was your favorite opponent to wrestle over the years? Oh, just, uh, wow. Reno Riggins, uh, Owen Hart. Uh, wow. Uh, uh, Ben Jordan. Um, I had a lot of, uh, Lenny Lane. I've had a lot of, um, a lot of people I liked, you know, wrestling with, especially when they were kind of opposite of me. So we're going to have a wrestling match and chain wrestling and, and have fun. You know, it was really cool. That's cool. I know I uh, skipped a few people. I didn't mean to, but uh, I got a plethora of people that I, I could thank and, and uh, working with. They made me look good. I made them look good. The bottom line is a lot of guys don't notice. I'm going to give you a big secret. If any of you newbies are watching or even if you're veterans, because maybe I'm more of a veteran than you, but then maybe I'm not little secret when you're having a match is don't worry about yourself or the referee or the crowd. Get the match over. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Yeah. Get the match over. That's what's important. Not yourself, unless you're told specifically. But otherwise, what does that mean? Get the whole spectrum over. The referee, the fans, yourself, your opponent. Get the match over. <laughs> that's what's important. Absolutely. And that's how, that's how you have a, a total story told. You know, there's a, a lot of great wrestlers out there. But me, Barry Horowitz, wrestles great. I agree. Um, the next one on Five Second Frenzy, Barry, is your favorite book. My favorite book? Wow. Uh, hmm. Whoa, that's a hard one. Um, any anything involving, I guess, training and nutrition, and I can't think of one off the top of my head. Fair enough. Sorry, that's okay. Uh, your favorite TV show? Whoa, okay, I've got a lot of those. I'll just throw out uh, Housewives of Beverly Hills. 
<laughs> awesome. Uh, your favorite film? Oh, God. Whew. Got a lot of those. Yep. Got a lot of those. Uh, whoa. Hmm. <laughs> I just, um, uh, wow. Um, I'm trying to think of what, what uh, of course, uh, I love my cousin Vinny, by the way. <laughs> and awesome. I've been watching that all week. And anything with uh, Jason Statham, Stallone, all those action type movies, uh, horror movies. Yeah, it's hard to put. I don't know if I could put a favorite. Uh, my A Few Good Men is that's oh, in that's, my top 10. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. that's in my top 10. Uh, 310 to Yuma. Uh, it's really good. Uh, uh, Tombstone. Wow. Yeah, These are cool. all in my top 10. Top 10. So, uh, yeah, that's a hard one to narrow down to one. I yeah. actually like the movie The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've actually been in that area where they were filming that. That was a, a shoot area. They really did it there. Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah no, a lot of people have a hard time answering favorite film. Um, hopefully you don't have too much of a difficult time with the next one. Your favorite musical artist. Ha ha. Whoa. <laughs> Darn it. Uh I'm just going to go with Blake Shelton. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, your yep. favorite food. Okay, is that cheat meal or healthy meal? Anything. Oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> well, I like, I mean, of course, um, whatchamacallit, um, uh, I'm trying to think. Um I like pizza. I like cheeseburgers, but I like my chicken and rice. So yeah, that's a hard one too. My yeah. pizza and burgers and a good Cuban sandwich. Uh, forgive me for thinking you got me perplexed because <laughs> I like all that stuff. But as far as my favorite food, you know, egg whites and my chicken, my rice, my tuna. Very nice. Um, your favorite place to eat on the road. Any Northeastern diner. And Subway. Nice. Very cool. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you partake in uh, drinking or not, uh, Barry, but your favorite alcoholic beverage, or if not, just your favorite drink to have. I, I always drink water. I drink, I'm on a pretty strict diet, so I only drink two light beers a week. It's either Mick Ultra or Miller Lite. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, second last one, Barry, is your favorite female body part. Oh, <laughs> it's a toss up between the chest and the ass. <laughs> very good. And uh, Barry, I'm not sure if uh, you curse very much, but the, the final one is your favorite curse word. Oh, uh, that's easy. It's a uh, uh, motherfucker. <laughs> Awesome, Barry. Well, that's the end of Five Second Frenzy, and we're now coming to the end of the interview here. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me here today. Uh, I really appreciate it, and it's been so fun getting to know you, and you've been hilarious and just so much fun oh, to talk thanks. to. And I just want to say I hope you're very proud of everything that you accomplished in your life, whether it's wrestling and nutrition and helping other people and, and having a wonderful family. Um, and I just hope you're very proud, sir. Thank you. I, I am. And um, um, it's all of the above that you mentioned, Carl. And, um, you know, it was a pleasure to meet you to do your show. I've heard a lot about it and continue success in the new year. And give yourself a pat on the back right now. I will. Thank you, Barry. I will. <laughs> okay. I could sue you now for doing that. <laughs> please, please. That's called, that's called gimmick infringement. <laughs> Well, but not you. really because we're on film and I allowed you to do that. If yeah. it was any other, if it was a, some kind of jabron or some lackey from somewhere I didn't like, I'd sue him. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Barry. And I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Appreciate it. And thank you everyone out there for watching the WZWA network podcast. 
This has been my interview with the one and only Mr. Technical Barry Horowitz, and we will see you next time. Thank you.